Okay. Hi, Jamila, again. Hi. Hi. So I have a few questions and I'm going to start asking them. Uh, my first question is, how do old memories affect your life now? Uh, they affect my life. Uh, all the time there is they are part of my being because this is what human beings are made up of is their memories but especially in the last five years with the election of this last president and the move to increased racism and increase movements against women and immigrants so in that sense, my memories were constant. In fact, I started having PTSD five years ago when when he ran his campaign. So I'm I'm very much uh, now uh, plagued uh, uh, by my memories because so much of what's happening today, not just in the United States, but also in Germany with the RFD, is all of that brings back my memories uh, of my childhood. I hope we will never go back to what Germany did, but to Jews and gays and physically and mentally handicapped people, but everything else, the suppression of the press and the scapegoating of people uh, in Germany, of course, it's against immigrants and Muslims, and here it's against blacks and immigrants and Latinos. So in, in, in that sense, my fear now is, uh, even though he was not elected again, the movement on the right here is now so strong that I am now always uh, remember my childhood and remember the, the uh, fact that all of my relatives but three were murdered. So, you know, I don't think that on a massive scale that that will happen, <clears throat> but police brutality shows that certain groups of people are being persecuted. And also that goes back to memory. Yes, I am always reminded of my early life. And you talked about Mississippi and how was it to build up the freedom schools and how was it to teach them? I'm not a teacher. So when I went to Mississippi, it was to register voters. That was how I wound up in Mississippi because it was before the election in 1964 and very important election and blacks could not vote. So we would register black voters and do everything possible with it. And at some point, I was told that I was to run a freedom school. So I was plunged into the freedom school and I taught all kinds of ages. And as I said, I had no experience, but I taught history a little bit, you know, of what I knew about European black history, history, black history, and talked about things that were happening then. I talked about the election. And there was one young white boy who would bring a little local newspaper. And I told him he didn't have any money and that I really couldn't afford it. And he said, oh, I'm just bringing it to you. And he wanted to come to the Freedom School as well. And I was delighted because I thought it would be great for the black children and for him to be together. So I called the project director in Jackson, Mississippi to tell him that this white boy wanted to be in my class, in my school. And they said that that was okay, but I had to get permission from his parents. So I told him that he could come, but I needed a written permission from his parents. And he said that his mother would allow it, but his father would not. And so I had to tell him that he couldn't come. I was very sad about it, but one of the things this little boy did, he tore down all of the Goldwater uh, election posters and I gave him Johnson posters to put in their place. So, so I made a young uh, white activist in Mississippi. And how did you experience the children there in the freedom schools? I loved them. <laughs>
and I worried about them. Uh, I thought that they were amazing, and you know, children are amazing. You know, especially now that I'm a lot older, I realize how wonderful children are, and how innocent and how capable of love they are. And uh, this is the school. Can you see it? Do you need to hold it up differently? Yes, I can see it. The cross was burned and I decided to put freedom on the cross and put it out every day. And then one day I got a lot of phone call telling me that they knew I was alone and that they were coming to kill me. And we had a pay phone in the school, which was just a very poor white a wooden house. So I constantly kept getting these phone calls and they were from a woman and telling me that uh, they were going to come and kill me. And I didn't have any change. I didn't have a dime to make a telephone call for somebody to come and rescue me. And I also saw a car going by back and forth and back and forth in front of the school. And so I decided to send the children home because I did not want them to be in danger. And uh, I had at one point written to publishers in New York to get books for the school, different books. And one publisher sent hundreds of books on etiquette. Uh, and a book was called Amy Vanderbilt's Book of Etiquette. You know, perfectly silly, white, tea-zipping ladies sort of books, which were totally useless, but I used them as art material, and I also used them as room dividers. So uh, after I sent the children home, I started to hide behind these books, and then I heard the footsteps on, this, on these creaky steps to the front of the school, and I decided that I wasn't going to get murdered behind the books, so I took a kind of old have eaten broom and go out there and I held the broom like some sort of witch to defend myself. But it was my project director and Stokely Carmichael who had come. And it turned out that one of the little children, one of the little girls went home and said that there was something wrong and her mother was busy. She had other children and was sort of ignoring it. And, and she kept saying, mommy, there's something wrong because Marion sent us home, but she didn't even tell us she loved us or gave us a hug. She didn't do anything. She just, you know, was very hard and kept saying, come on, you know, I want you to go home now. And, and so she said, there's something wrong. I know it. And there were lots of phone calls. And so the mother called the project director and they came. And once I saw that they were my friends, I passed out, I fainted from just, you know, from just relief. I have letters that she wrote me from Mississippi and that was her main concern. How can I ever leave these children? And she considered, would you come to Mississippi, move <laughs> with, bring Danny down yeah. here? It was that strong a bond. I always felt that, to some extent, this second family made up for some of her loss as a child of family members. It was really a strong bond. Yes. Anyway, it's a pleasure to see you and to have heard your conversation. You were arrested. When and how often and why? Did you get arrested? One time when after the election of Johnson uh, against Goldwater for, you know, this is a voter registration activity I was engaged in with SNCC, Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. My co-workers and some friends, uh, all of them black women, they were, uh, I think, four of us, decided that we were going to go to a local drugstore. In America, in these drugstores, they would have lunch counters, counters where you could have a milkshake or a sandwich or whatever. 
and we decided that we were going to go in there, even though Snake had decided that we were never ever to try to integrate places, but we were so excited and we were young and we decided, oh, to hell with it, we are going to do this. So we sat there and we knew that even the manager was already on the phone to call the police and we were told that they were not going to serve us and uh, they also used the N-word a lot. We finally just decided we were going to leave. We had made our point and we were sitting in the car and I don't quite know how to put this without using the N-word because it was what we laughed about. Should I, you think? Yeah. Okay, so this is what happened. The four of us were sitting there and we had agreed beforehand to make our protest simple by just saying we wanted uh, a banana split. This is a particular kind of ice cream dish uh, so that it would be very simple. And so this attention was already there about uh, they were not going to serve us and they were also very nasty. And at one point, the person behind the counter said, you know, after we were told that we had to leave many times, she said, we don't serve niggers. And it pains me to use the term. And my friend turned and said, oh, we don't want niggers, we want banana splits. Which was so funny that when we were sitting in the car, we laughed because my friend was so quick with this response and we were sitting there laughing about it when the police came and arrested me. And I don't know why they arrested me and not my friends was because I, I was the driver. So they arrested me. We got to the police station and the person at the police station said, what is the charge? And the person arresting me said, mm, I don't know. And uh, he said, oh, what about speeding? Okay, so the person behind the counter said, okay, speeding. I had never even turned the key in the car. I was, we were just sitting there. And then the person uh, behind said, but why don't you make it drunken driving as well? So added that to it. And so then I was in jail for these things and I also was on trial and I was sentenced to 280 days in jail. And during the trial, it was very strange. It was so illegal, the trial, because the police could not ever keep his lies straight so that he just, you know, from one sentence to the next, had a different lie that finally the judge started, you know, bringing the case against me. All of the black community was in the courtroom at that point, and the judge was then bringing the case against me, which even I, without being a lawyer, knew that that's not how things go. And I had the most important civil rights lawyers at this trial, and they were called the Legal Aid New Orleans. So I turned to them and said, you know, this is against the law. And there was also nobody taking notes. It was ridiculous. So they told me to be quiet and I was sentenced to 280 days. And I was taken back to my cell and I told my lawyers that because it was so illegal that I wanted to serve the time and take it to the Supreme Court because it was so blatantly a misuse of justice. And they said, no, that that was not possible because I had so embarrassed the whole situation and the judge that I would never come out of this alive, that I would even, you know, before the night ended, they would have murdered me because of what happened. So they bribed the judge, you know, instead of 280 days, they gave him, I don't know how much money, and I was forced to leave the state. So that was the scariest arrest ever. On the 50th anniversary of the Freedom Summer 1964, when I was in Mississippi, Daniel persuaded me to go back to Mississippi and try to contact the people who were in my freedom school, and that was wonderful. I always thought that I was there for four months, but did I really make a difference? You know, you always ask yourself, do I make a difference? Does anything I do make a difference? 
And I tend to think, well, probably whatever I do doesn't really make that much of a difference. I went back and it turns out that one of my students had become the first black mayor of the town where I lived. Another of my students had become a librarian, and, and as she said, because I had taught her such a love of reading and books that she could only figure out the way to deal with that was to become a librarian. And I'm in constant touch with her. And another one had become the first black police chief. And I had taught some adults to read who couldn't read. That was the only thing when I came back from Mississippi where I felt I had made a difference because I had taught some people to read because I learned to read when I was not even four years old. So I couldn't even imagine what it was like not to read. It was great. That was my last question. And okay, thank, you. I thank you for answering my questions. and. Good. They were good questions, and I enjoyed talking with you. And I liked the one-on-one. -on -one. It was very nice. Yes, thank you. And I see your teacher and my friend right behind you there. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> I put myself back in the picture. Yes. Uh -huh. I wanted to, to tell you that you are still making a difference, and I think you made a difference even tonight, even to Jamila. You make me blush. Thank you, my dear. So what are your plans? How do you think you want to fight? I took part of the Black Lives Matter demonstration in Hamburg before COVID. Uh, I share stories on my Instagram, uh, for example, and I try to encourage the people to make a difference and understand racism and discrimination. I think it's important to teach stories and things so that we young people understand how the word works. Do you, do you, as a black woman, experience racism? Yeah, at a shopping mall in Hamburg. And I was standing there with a friend and two police officers came and just ran into us. And I turned around and I asked what's happening. And uh, he said, yeah, it's not your place to be here and walked. How do you deal with that? I talk about it. And I think it's kind of hard to deal with it because most of the time when I experience and feel like it was uh, something a racist, that people tell me like, yeah, you take it. It's not that deep. It's not that hard. Like, get over it. So many people don't understand when I feel like I got offended by it and felt like it was racist, that it was racist. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, it was, and you have you have a double uh, thing. You're an immigrant as well. You're a black and an immigrant. And I don't know how it is in your class. Are, are your classmates kind to you and friendly and sympathetic yeah. to you? Yeah. You know, form groups of people to talk about it, to, to widen it, to, to talk about what you experience, because what you experience is an experience that is true and not exaggerated, and you have to speak up. You cannot speak up against a policeman because they have the power and, yeah. the, and the clubs and the tools, but you can write a letter to the newspaper and say, I was at a shopping mall today, and because I'm a young black woman, the policeman came up to me and said, that you have no right to be here. And that is Don't one get way. Her in trouble. <laughs> that's one way you write about it and you write it to a newspaper. They send something to Der Spiegel. Uh, Speak no, out. We, we took your we took your teacher to a demonstration at the White House with my favorite picket sign. The Black Lives Matter demo was uh, a very nice experience. It, it is a good experience to be together with people fighting for a cause, and it makes you feel better. And we demonstrated together, Steph, in the summer. The anti-globalization demonstration. Yeah. 
Well, that was funny, Jamila, because Marion and Daniel were in Hamburg and were thinking, when can we meet? And they said, but on Sunday we can't because we've got to go to this demonstration. You have to come along. Very impressive demonstration, too. Yeah, it made sure. a big impression on us. Yes.